go ahead and uh, we're going to kick things off. I'm going to introduce our, our speaker, our scholar, who, by the way, has spent time, spent plenty of time in the Sacramento room, um, downtown and Central Library, doing research. In, in fact, I'd love to say he spent most of his time here doing research, but that's not true. I know that I would have liked to have spent most of my time there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Roland. Um, spending time in Southern California, of course, in the Bay Area, using those repositories to get a lot of his research done. So who is our speaker? Roland DeWolk uh, is a scholar, a professor, author, and a UC Berkeley educated historian who left academia uh, for a career in journalism, which he and I were just talking about before opening up the doors. Uh, he then returned to teach at a San Francisco Bay Area University as an adjunct while retaining his prize-winning investigative reporting work. Uh, as an award-winning journalist, his work has been read in the New York Times, The Guardian, um, one of my favorite publications, and then also broadcast over CNN. He is also obviously an educator and taught at SF State's journalism department for the last 25 years. Um, American Disruptor, it's a, it's a real deal book uh, and it's no feat to be published um, or it's, it's a huge feat to be published by the UC Press. Um, just a fantastic publishing house and organization They've got a lot of things going on. Um, and the book has also been praised um, and renowned um, by a lot of folks. Um, so a careful historian, deeply researched book. Um, oh, and I should, I should also add excerpts. Deeply researched and a rollicking biography are used to describe um, American Disruptors. So we're so lucky to have Roland here. I'm talking too much. I need to stop. And with that said, I hand things over to Roland DeWalk. Thanks for being here, Roland. My pleasure. And thank you again to all of you, and especially to you, James, for putting this thing together. It is very much my pleasure and my pride. Sacramento is one of my absolute favorite places. And yes, I've taken every opportunity I could to come up there, not only to use the, the Sacramento library system, which is fantastic, but all the other wonderful stuff that happens there, the, the archives, the state library, so on and so forth. And it's just a totally cool town. I uh, did an internship up there in the summer of 1975, back when there were still dinosaurs in California, uh, working for the California Journal. And I think that's when I, I grew up in the Bay Area, but I think I fell in love with Sacramento that summer. And I use any opportunity that I can uh, to do that. And it's, it, it's fun for me to be able to talk about Leland Stanford because he really kind of started his his ascent to power, if you will, I'll steal Robert Caro's line about LBJ, in Sacramento. Uh, but he was born in 1824 uh, in Albany. Before I start giving you a quick rundown about his life and, the, and the, uh, the legacy, which is really much more enormous than I think that has ever been given kind of the, uh, the, the credit that he should have gotten, or the blame as well, uh, I want to tell you that I, I strongly believe, and I, and I make this case in the book, and I hope that you'll all have an opportunity, you haven't read it already, to, to do so that Leland Stanford has somehow escaped the, the scrutiny, uh, the accountability, and yes, the respect that uh, somebody who uh, clearly is a seminal figure for historic and for very, very modern reasons. And I will explain my thinking behind that as we go along here. He was, as I mentioned, born in what is today Albany, New York, in a bar. Uh, he was born at a, at a saloon uh, it was called the Bull's Head uh, Saloon, uh, just outside of what was then Central Albany in 1824. And as a young man, I think the word that comes to my mind most often is, is feckless. He was really kind of a failure at almost everything he did. His parents sent him off to three successive schools, and he either was expelled or he dropped out of every one of them. Consequently, Leland Stanford, the founder of one of the world's great universities, and remember, my book is going to be about Leland Stanford, the man in his times and his legacy, not very much about Stanford University. 
which I have nothing but admiration for. Uh, but it's kind of ironic that the, the founder of one of the world's great universities would, did not have what today would be the equivalency of even a high school diploma. And this has something to do with the way that Stanford evolved and, 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 and what Stanford University is today as well. And we'll get to that in just a little bit. Uh, he became, however, as an adult, a very powerful figure, not just here in California, but and not just here in the United States, but from a cultural standpoint, one who has influence worldwide. And again, that's a case that I'm going to make for you before the end of uh, hopefully not too long talk here. He unwittingly disrupted the whole arc of our economy, our politics, and yes, even our culture. So He's born in 1824 in New York, and I have some cheat sheets here, so forgive me if you see me looking down every once in a while, because it's a fairly dense story, and I want to keep it as clean and, and as fun to listen to as possible. Uh, he, as I, I mentioned, had a lot of trouble as a young man. He finally seemed to find his feet when he apprenticed at a law, at a law firm in Albany for a couple of years and actually passed the New York bar which is something that we discovered only after the first edition was printed. Uh, there was ample reason to believe that he had made up that claim. Uh, we've corrected it in the, uh, the new paperback version, which uh, is somewhere around here. I think it's behind me. Maybe you can see it back there someplace. Uh, but he did pass the bar. But interestingly enough, and sort of mysteriously enough, Leland Stanford decided, even though he had passed the New York State Bar, that he was going to leave Albany, leave New York, leave his friends, leave his family, leave everything he knows for an obscure little village, really, not much more than that, called Port Washington, a little bit north of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And there he got a job apprenticing again at a local law firm and worked there for two years before he finally passed the Wisconsin Bar and set up his own practice. But in this, too, he had nothing but failure. He struggled with the law practice. And then one early winter morning, late winter, but early in the morning, a fire ravaged the little downtown there, burned his office to cinders, destroyed his, his invoices, his chits, his law books, everything. And he was once again bereft. The only good thing that happened to Leland Stanford while he was in Port Washington uh, in Wisconsin was that he had been wooing and he did eventually marry uh, a young woman from Albany, Jane Lathrop. Now, you will not hear me call her Jane for the rest of my little talk here. I'm going to call her Jenny. And the reason I do so is because that's the name that she went by. That's the name that he addressed her by. That's the name that she preferred. And uh, I think it's most appropriate to refer to her as Jenny. And she's an important part of the story, which is why I'm making a special note about that. Nevertheless, uh, he failed again here in Port Washington, and he left Jenny in Albany for three years, and he came to California. He came to Sacramento, as a matter of fact, where he had three brothers who had come here in 1849. You probably can imagine why they came here in 1849, and like a lot of other pretty smart, enterprising people who came for the gold rush, they quickly found that there was uh, maybe not as much sudden wealth, but certainly a lot more stability and safety and long-term prosperity by opening a store that pandered to, maybe pandered is a, the wrong word, but uh, uh, equipped the, the gold miners, the, the, um, the, the prospectors. They sold them uh, gold pans, clothes, tobacco, whiskey, all the kinds of good stuff that you want if you're going to be a 49er out of their store. And I'm sure that many, perhaps all of you are familiar with the, the facade is the Stanford Brothers there in Old Town, Sacramento. It's not really the same place. It's close to the same place. It's put up there. But that's great that it's there. It, it reminds us of our history. So he came to Sacramento. He was busted. He didn't have a dollar to his name. His brother said to him, look, uh, you've had a pretty rough go of it here, Leland. This is 1851 now. Uh, we're going to send you up, up into the gold fields. We're going to send you up into the, the foothills, so a little town called Cold Spring, which really doesn't exist anymore. I think there's just um, like a marker there. And we're going to see if you can open up a branch store and have any luck running the uh, Stanford Brothers Cold Spring. He goes up there. That store does okay, but then it looks a little bit better in a place a little bit north, pretty close to where John Marshall uh, first stumbled into the gold, and a place called Michigan City, which completely doesn't exist at all anymore. There is a placard there for sure. And there he sets up the store, and he's doing pretty well. But here is the, the reason that he did really well there. And this is an important, it'll be an amusing story perhaps for you, but it's an important story as well. The 
Placer County Board of Supervisors needed a justice of the peace uh, for the area. And you, you can well imagine there's probably a whole, not a whole heck of a lot of lawyers who are up there in, you know, <laughs> up there in the gold country in the mother load in 1851, 1852. But he did have this law uh, practice and he was a bona fide lawyer uh, from back east. So he applied to and he was appointed the, uh, the justice of the peace up there. And so he ran his courtroom uh, uh, at the same place as he had his store. And then he moved the store and the courtroom into the family's legacy business, which was a saloon. He built and he ran this place called the Empire Saloon up there. And the Empire, obviously, sort of a tribute to his native state in New York. But there he dispensed frontier justice and liquor at the same time and at the same place. The thing that's important about this that I want you to remember as we go on here a little bit was this was the time that Leland first demonstrates his understanding of something that's very modern today, and many people still raise their eyebrows out, conflating his personal ambitions to make money, his enterprise with his public responsibilities. He found was, if I might stretch my metaphor a little bit further, a very powerful cocktail. And this is going to prove very important very shortly. His brothers down in Sacramento, down in old, what we call Old Town, down where you guys are, it, 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 well, back in Sacramento, his, parent, his, his brothers decide that they want to start a new entrepreneurial adventures. Uh, some go to Australia, some go back east again. Uh, one, his older brother, Josiah, starts one of the first, perhaps the first petroleum company in San, in, uh, in San Francisco. Uh, they say, Lily, why don't you come down and take care of the store, which he does. And then he brings Jenny back out from the East Coast. And there we have Stanford Brothers, uh, uh, the, the store that is now selling a lot of particularly food, but also dry goods as well. Now, here's the important thing about the Stanford Brothers store. Around the corner from the store, there's a guy who's selling carpets and shoes. His name is Charles Crocker. Right next door, and many of you know this already, particularly if you've gazed up at the, the facades there in Old Town, there are two other guys who are selling hardware. One of them is uh, Hopkins, and the other one is Huntington, right? So you have Mark Hopkins and you have Collis Huntington. Now, these guys are way smart. Uh, they are take no prisoners businessmen. And when they meet their next door neighbor, their, their around the corner neighbor, Leland Stanford, they immediately see him as a potential asset for them to acquire because they have some very big ambitions. You have to remember, this is a time that when um, the Civil War is really kind of brewing and we have a Mormon insurrection that is pretty serious in Utah. And we have a tremendous amount of gold coming out of California that Washington, D.C. would like to be able to have some control over and put in its coffers and increase the national wealth. One way to tie this much more fractious nation than anything that any of us have seen in our recent lifetimes, despite all the storm and drang about that, we have a civil war that needs uh, something to start healing this country together. And this young Republican, the first Republican president, a guy from Illinois, you may have heard of him, Abraham Lincoln, is very much in favor of creating a transcontinental railroad. Lincoln, I might quickly add, was a railroad lawyer when he was in Illinois. So this is something that's very close to his heart as well as to his national policy. But in order to finance something as ambitious as a Transcontinental Railroad is way beyond the means or certainly way beyond the desires of any kind of private capitalist. The, the, the VCs of their day don't see any interest in doing that. It's going to cost way too much. The returns are not guaranteed and it'll take way too long when they could be making money hand over fist right away then two to 8% returns. So the government is going to finance this and uh, Hopkins, particularly Huntington and Crocker, they know this is in the works. And they're going to need somebody, though, who's a lot more political, somebody in a political office, somebody they can control, somebody who looks like a politician. Ergo, Leland Stanford. He stands just maybe an inch or two shy of six feet. He's maybe 190, 200 pounds. He has a basso profundo voice. And he has this very serious sort of continence about him. Uh, he looks he looks like a successful politician. And they'll be able to say, this guy's a successful businessman. You know, we Americans 
uh, many Americans tend to think that if you're very successful in business or if you pretend to be very successful in business, that somehow that gives you legitimacy as somebody who can um, do something with our, our government problems that we have. So they start um, grooming him, if you will, uh, to start running for office. They ran him for a variety. They ran him for alderman in Sacramento. He got crushed. Uh, they ran him for treasurer, state California. He got crushed. I, I'll get back to that in just a minute. At the same time, there's a name that somebody, some of you uh, may well be familiar with, a guy named Theodore Judah, who is a brilliant young engineer that another railroad aspirants, uh, some other railroad aspirants, bring out from the East Coast to see if he can find a pass over the Sierra Nevada, because that seems to be the big political and engineering problem. How are we gonna get a rail line over those incredibly steep and wondrous mountains of ours? Judah comes out and he finds that pass. And you know what it is, it's essentially I-80, it's Donner Pass. But at that time, that was a, a real mystery. He finds it and he comes back. He has a problem with these railroad guys who brought him out here. He's your classic. He looks very much, uh, in retrospect, to somebody who's like your brilliant Silicon Valley engineer who just doesn't really quite understand how capitalism works, but he understands that he's got a problem, a big problem, big engineering problem, and he can solve it. So he uh, breaks off with them, and he's trying to find somebody to finance his brilliant plan for this railroad. But he's having a lot of trouble with that, because as I mentioned before, the capitalists are very hesitant to put any of their time or money into this thing. He comes to a meeting in Sacramento where he meets some of the local financiers, some of the bankers and some of the, uh, the hoity-toity business guys of Sacramento at the time. And they're all, gosh, you know, Mr. Judah, sounds great. It's really interesting, but I don't think it's for us. But there's a guy in the back of the room who's listening. No, it's not Leland Stanford. It's Collis Huntington, who is a brilliant man in his own right. And Collis waits till everybody's gone and he comes up to young uh, Theodore Judah and he says, you know, your plan's pretty interesting. Uh, how would you like to take a meeting with me and some of my partners uh, up at my hardware store? You can come down on Thursday night and, you know, and we can talk about this. And of course, Judah has got no place else to go, says, that's a wonderful idea. I'd be happy to meet there. So he goes and there he meets, of course, Huntington and he meets Crocker and he meets Hopkins and he meets Leland Stanford. They put together the Central Pacific Railroad Company. They appoint Judah as the chief engineer and they all give themselves titles, but the best title for the front man, the guy who's going to be the politician, the guy who's going to be the salesman there is going to be young Leland Stanford. He's in his early thirties now. And he's going to be the president of the Central uh, Pacific Railroad, which really doesn't exist yet. But Judah, who's had some very deep and, and important experience in Washington, D.C., says, I'm going to go back to the nation's capital and I'm going to try to engineer this thing so we can get the contract to do this. And he does this very successfully. In point of fact, Judah becomes the lead staff person on the House Committee on the Railroad. He becomes the lead uh, staff person for the Senate Committee on the railroad. And as such, it essentially authors the bill that gives us exclusive Western end of the contract to the Central Pacific and does so under amazingly favorable terms. Uh, they're going to borrow using bonds money, which of course is just sort of a soft way to increase your taxes. Uh, amazing amount of bonds money. Today would be well over a billion dollars in today's money that the uh, Central Pacific has agreed is a loan They've written this down, they've signed it, they're going to pay it all back with interest, simple interest, not compound interest, in 30 years. Done deal. Now, we're going to keep running Leland to put him in a position of power. They ran him for governor now and he lost the first time, but the second time in 1861, at age 37, he becomes governor of California while he is the president of the Central Pacific Railroad. So I will ask you to remember what he learned up there, uh, up in, the, up in uh, the mother load about putting together this blend of the private interest and the public interest and make it work for him, which he does very successfully. And this is where Leland Stanford, this failure, this feckless young man really starts to come into his own now. He's goes to the, uh, to the local cities. He went to this Sacramento city council, to the alderman there, pardon me. And he says, look, 
If you want to have your train station here in Sacramento instead of someplace else nearby, you're going to have to pony up a little bit more money than what we have from just the federal government. And although there are some objections, he wins the day and the people of Sacramento have to start taxing themselves extra to get the rail line there. That works so well, he starts going to other cities and he starts going to other counties. And that works so well, he went to the state legislature and he bullies, not my word, but one of his Republican contemporaries, he was a Republican, by the way, uh, his Republican contemporaries, that's his word, bullies the state legislature into passing even more bonds money that goes into this private enterprise, the Central Pacific Railroad. The money starts rushing in. The terms are really very interesting. And I'll, I won't go into those kind of details. I, I would encourage you that if you haven't read it already, but hopefully you can get the book uh, at the library if you don't want to buy it. <laughs> I'm more than totally fine with that. And you can see these extraordinary terms that they gave them. So now we have this money rushing in. They start building the railroad. And uh, Judah, unfortunately, breaks off with them as well as he had with the earlier uh, entrepreneurs who had brought him out there. And then very unfortunate, tragically, uh, dies at a very young age when he goes back to New York to try to put together another finance package. He got uh, yellow fever when he was crossing through the, uh, through the isthmus in, in Central America to go back over. So he's out of the picture. Uh, Hopkins, Crocker, Huntington, and Stanford, of course, as we all know as Californians, as the big four, have it all to themselves now, and they're ready to go. So they start building this railroad, and they start taking in all this wonderful money, and what do you think they start doing with all this great money that they're getting from everybody from Los Angeles up to Sacramento and every place in between, not to mention uh, the enormous sums of money they're getting from the federal taxpayers. Uh, they start, um, well, I, I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Stanford Mansion in Sacramento, but I presume that at least some of you have. That's the first thing that Leland Stanford does. He builds the biggest, most grandiose house in Sacramento. The others were a little bit more modest in the way that they displayed their wealth, but not Leland. He just completely eclipsed them in the way that he was spending money left and right on race horses and um, photography to see whether all the four hoofs were up at the same time and all kinds of other crazy stuff. I'll get back into that in just a minute. As governor, he not only is bullying the state legislature and uh, the counties and uh, the local jurisdictions in so far, even as the cities, to start giving them more money, but they start using this money also to start buying and to start building anything that even smells like a competitive railroad. And more than just railroads, they buy into and start controlling even the ferries that are coming down the San Joaquin River and the Sacramento River and across San Francisco Bay. And in order, and this is all in order to do one thing, as you can well imagine, create one of the first biggest monopolies in American business history. They completely control all of that. And it's not just for passengers, of course. This has to do with our growing agricultural bounty, sending stuff back east sending stuff to the south, sending stuff to the north, importing stuff. Who built this railroad, though? It was not these four guys. They didn't get out there with chisels, and they didn't get out there, you know, to, to break through the granite, the tunnels up in the Sierra Nevada. No, they, they needed thousands and thousands of workers, and they were having a lot of trouble attracting and keeping uh, many of the, the, uh, the people of European heritage, if you will, of European descent, so they reluctantly at first, but then enthusiastically when they found that, that they could pay them less, they could work them harder, and they were more sober. These were the Chinese Californians who came here for the same reason that so many other people came here, for a better life, for prosperity, for a chance to extract some of the gold from what was called by the Chinese gold mountain, so on and so forth. And at the end, the railroad had, had uh, employed at a minimum of some 12,000 uh, of the Chinese who came to California, and some estimates as much as 20,000. And as I mentioned, they paid them less, they worked them harder. Uh, one time they went on a brief strike and they just decided, well, we're not gonna give you any more food. They starved them into submission and nobody said anything. God knows how many uh, the poor guys died in the, in the avalanches and in the tunnels. We know that's in the dozens, but of course they didn't document that sort of thing. So we don't really, really know. The money kept rolling in here, and in order to manipulate it the way that they thought would be to their most, uh, their greatest advantage, 
Uh, Stanford and company, and Stanford increasingly is taking more control over this. He's, he, Stanford is really coming into his own here. He's not just sort of an asset to them anymore. The roles are starting to reverse. But with, uh, with Leland here now in charge, and with Hopkins, who's really the financial guy, and Huntington, who is kind of one of the big manipulators, and Crocker is the road crew boss, essentially, start, they, they start creating a series of companies that essentially launders that money. So there's a really hard way. It's very, very difficult to trace where that money's going. And we're going to get to that because that's the single greatest uh, scandal of all the little scandals that I just, not so little scandals as well that are described in the book, but we don't have really time to dwell into it too much today unless you guys have uh, some specific questions about that. So now they're laundering this money. Stanford is starting to buy real estate left and right. One of the first things that he likes to build is a little hill. It's on a little hill in San Francisco where all the so-called nabobs live. And he builds a big mansion atop, of course, what is Knob Hill. And he decides he wants to become, uh, and this is very much like the Silicon Valley uh, billionaires of art today. Uh, he decides he would like to own a big winery. And he starts and he builds what was then the biggest winery uh, and vineyards in the world in a little town a little bit north of Chico called Vina. It's still there. This is the little little tiny place. Uh, and there's a little monastery there that our late great, well, I shouldn't say late, our, our, our former governor, Jerry Brown, likes to go to every year and think his great deep thoughts or whatever he does there in the monastery. Nevertheless, uh, Vine is still there and it's a pretty cool place. And I, I all suggest you go take a look there and there's still a little winery up there, which is kind of cool too. So he builds this big thing and then he decides that he wants to have a sunny little ranch because you know, San Francisco is a pretty darn cold place a lot of the time. Uh, being an East Bay boy, I can say that with a big smile on my face. So he decides there's this little place, uh, you know, like 30 miles south of San Francisco, big, beautiful ranch land with verdant creeks and ancient oaks. And he uh, starts buying more than 8,000 acres and he puts together there. And he decides he's going to name it this lovely name that was uh, given to uh, a tree there, the Palo Alto. And of course, that becomes his ranch. And of course, later on, we know what happens there, but we'll get to that in just a minute. So life looking pretty good for a Leland Stanford senior. One of the things that was frustrating for he and Jenny throughout this time was that for 18 years, they wanted to have children and it was a barren marriage. But after 18 years, she was pregnant with a, with a boy, Leland Stanford Jr., who by all accounts and by all available evidence was really kind of an extraordinarily smart, sweet, good kid. And they wanted to groom him to become a great, uh, you know, commander of American enterprise, that he would inherit uh, the control of the railroad and he would become a governor himself and perhaps president of the United States one day. They were preparing him for this kind of life. They were going to have him go into Harvard University when he was 16, which was not uncommon at the time. But just before he was going to go there, they decided to take another grand tour of Europe. They loved to spend their money going to very expensive spas and buying jewels and buying horses. They lived a very extravagant life. They took Leland off to Europe for a, a, a grand tour, but Leland came down with typhoid and he died in a hotel in Florence at age 15. And this is the pivot point of the Stanford's life. Uh, losing a child uh, has got to be the greatest tragedy that any human being probably ever face, as I think we can all imagine and hope that we only have to imagine it. Uh, but he dies and they are torn asunder. This is, this is uh, the, as I say, the apex and the, the, the beginning of the descent in many ways uh, of the life of Leland Stanford Sr. They want to build a memorial to their son and they're starting to think about how they can do that. But in the meantime, as he's thinking about this, Leland is getting a little bit off the tracks here on his message. So for example, in, in 1869, when they were able to put the, the Union Pacific coming from the Midwest and the Central Pacific from, the, from, the, from Sacramento, where it started, pardon me, uh, at Promontory Point in Utah, which is a very cool little place if you ever get a chance to go there, if you haven't been there already, uh, he is infamously says, you know, uh, we don't think that we should actually pay that money back to the United States taxpayers. We think that they should just be grateful to us that we're doing this magnificent thing and we should just keep all this money. So people are starting to get a little bit nervous about this. That on top of the monopoly, the control that he has there is making people 
even more nervous. The state starts to launch some investigations into what is going on with the railroad. But Leland, <clears throat> pardon me, is having some pretty good luck quashing these investigations through a variety of means, not the least of which are bribing the people who are supposed to be doing the investigations. One of which, for example, he helped get the land together for the Vina uh, winery. It gets all sort of complicated, but it, I make it pretty clear in the book if you have an opportunity to look at it. So the federal government now starts to get very nervous because that is, again, as I mentioned, the equivalency of a, more than a billion dollars in federal money. And they can't be left holding the bag on this. So Congress launches a year-long investigation into what happened to our money, because they can't seem to find it because of this, this, this uh, series of three different laundromats, if you will, for our federal tax dollars. And this is the great scandal that takes place, aside from many other ones that are notable as well. But this is the great scandal, because what happens here is when they want to see the books Leland says he's never seen the books, even though he's the president of the company. We said, well, can you get the books anyway? And he says, gosh, you know, I don't know where the books are. They said, well, can you find the books? And then he comes back to, to the investigators. They're having the hearings in San Francisco, the congressional investigators. And he says, gosh, I hate to tell you this, but it looks like the books have been destroyed. This is just an outrage. So the, the, the Congress uh, members, the members of Congress are very upset about this and they pr start pressing him pretty hard about this. And then he gets very indignant. He says, they're asking him rude questions. And after all, he is Leland Stanford. And who are you to ask me those sorts of questions? And you're being very rude, sir. Well, they throw their hands up and they take him to a high federal court. The structures have sort of changed then, but we're talking about a level that's very, very high in the federal court system here. It's a three judge panel. The good thing for Leland Stanford is that two of the three judges are there because of his influence, because he had largely decided who was gonna sit on this. And of course, you can guess what the two to three ruling was, so he got away with it. Well, this is a lot of bad press and it's not helping their stock. And it's not helping them expand their, air, their, their rails uh, from California because, for example, they want to go down the Southern route, which would have been a lot smarter, by the way. And they want to go from Los Angeles to Yuma and to New Orleans and come back up uh, to the East Coast. And they need to have some more su federal subventions. So at this point, Crocker has died in Monterey and uh, Hopkins has died in Yuma and Huntington who is a fascinating character, puts together a bloodless coup d'etat of the presidency, gets rid of Stanford and assumes the presidency of the railroad. And Stanford is left to deal with his, uh, with his memorial to his son, which is, of course, I don't need to tell you this, Leland Stanford Junior University. Stanford dies in 1893, dies at home, presumably in his sleep. Uh, he was not a well man. And one would imagine, of course, most people did believe that not only did he would leave behind great wealth for Jenny and for the university, but particularly for the university, he had left an enormous endowment. But it turns out when they went to probate that not only had he left no endowment whatsoever for the university, his estate was essentially bankrupt. He had borrowed so much money for all his ostentatious uh, 800 horses, you know, very expensive horses, his huge real estate uh, holdings, the vino, viner, uh, winery never made money. In fact, the people who were buying wine at the time called it undrinkable. So he tried to distill it into medicinal brandy, and that didn't work as well. And Jenny was faced with this brand new university where she couldn't pay the professors. She couldn't even pay the heating bill. What am I going to do? Well, now, to make things even worse, if you can imagine, the federal government sues Jenny and the estate for the millions and millions of dollars that the federal government has loaned to the taxpayers, and they want its money back. He goes all the way to the United States Supreme Court, where, and again, the details of this, the interesting details of this are in the book, and I won't go into it right now, she wins the case. So now some of the assets that were still around are still uh, available for her, and she rescues the university, which is one of the great stories that really have not been told. She was maybe not the nicest person in the world, 
But Jenny Stanford is one of the more remarkable women of the 19th century. And she has a remarkable story that I get into uh, in the book. And uh, one that I really would encourage you guys to all with your interest in history, not just Sacramento, not just California, but women's history, which uh, really doesn't get any kind of the play that it really deserves. She is a remarkable person and her story is there. Uh, now that she's kind of handled everything and, and it looks like she's going to be able to relax, finally she goes and she starts doing some very adventurous traveling. She goes to Ceylon, you know, or today Sri Lanka. She goes down the Nile. Uh, she's having a sort of a wonderful time. She's in her 70s now. But then something terribly untoward happens to her. She's in the Nob Hill mansion one evening drinking her bicarbonate soda. She had all kinds of health problems as well and spits it out because somebody has put rat poison in the bicarbonate uh, 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 into the soda water. They're trying to kill her. So her advisors say, Mrs. Stanford, you've got to get out of here. Somebody's trying to murder you. Why don't you get on a beautiful you know, steamer and go off to Hawaii and take it easy there. This is 1905, by the way. So she's going to go to Japan, but she's going to stop in Honolulu first, which she does. And she stays at the Moana, uh, which is now the, the Hilton on Waikiki Beach. Maybe some of you know it, but you can imagine 1905, what a spectacular place that would have been. And she goes there. She has uh, a wonderful time. Uh, one particular afternoon, they go out to the Pali Outlook. She comes back. She has a nice light dinner. She goes to bed early. And around 10 o'clock that night, she is screaming in the hotel hallway, I've been poisoned. And within an hour or two, she's dead. The inquest proves at a point of fact, she was murdered. And here comes one of the great cover-ups of the 20th century. David Starr Jordan, somewhat disgraced now, first president of Stanford University, can't afford to have another scandal at the university. There have been scandals at the university dealing with academic freedom that are still talked about in a scholarship about academic freedom. There is a wonderful little sex scandal that takes place in the library that should get you to read the book if nothing else does. And he can't afford to have any more of this because he needs to get some more money to keep the university running. At this point, Stanford's not the juggernaut that it is today, believe me. So he goes to Hawaii right away and engineers an incredible cover up of the murder. And to this day, and I anticipate somebody's going to be asking me this question, who do I think killed Jenny Stanford? And I'll wait, to, I won't even wait to tell you, I don't know, but we can get into that a little bit later. Um, he has an incredibly successful cover-up, and she dies. No one ever knows. No one probably will ever know who killed Jenny Stanford. The legacy, however, I'm going to wrap this up here with this, for Stanford University is something that, that I mentioned at the very beginning of my talk, is very modern. Stanford himself did not see the university as the sort of research university that we imagine today's Harvard's or Berkeley's uh, or, or, uh, or the University of Chicago. He saw it to be a trade school. And this is probably in large measure because of his lack of formal education and even his contempt for uh, the great universities that he had. He thought he needed a practical place. Uh, the, the library that he uh, gave to the university is smaller than the one that you see me, uh, you see behind me in my, one of my little bookshelves over here. He wanted it to be someplace that would teach people how to do important things like how to use electricity. And the legacy of this is not long after their deaths, the electricity department at Stanford University was a, a rocking place and creating all kinds of interesting things. There were a couple of kind of interesting, if odd, brothers called the Varians. Uh, there was a, a, guy, a student, this is the 1920s and the late teens, uh, a guy named Bill Hewitt. Uh, another guy named David Packard, and the uh, really forward-thinking head of the electro electricity, electronics department, a guy named Frederick Terman, went to the university and said, you know, we have these really smart, brilliant, really guys who are very entrepreneurial and come up with all kinds of interesting ideas, and we have 8,000 plus acres here. Why don't we put aside an area, we'll call it something like Stanford Research Park, give them some room to grow. Yes, this is the beginning of the Silicon Valley, which is still the incubator, not only just the birthplace, the incubator and the sustainer of the Silicon Valley. And this goes to my, to my position, my argument, which I think is very clear, that without Leland Stanford, there'd be no Stanford University. 
without Leland Stanford Junior University, there would be no Silicon Valley, which of course has transformed everything right down to the way that I'm talking to you and listening, hopefully to you today. Zoom, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Our lives are completely re revolutionized in the last, what, several decades. We'll leave it at that. Regardless, that is pretty much the, uh, the long, uh, the short story of my rather long story. And I am very grateful for you for hanging in here with me as I have uh, tried to race through it <laughs> as quickly, but as comprehensively as possible. And if anybody has any questions, I think... Um, uh, James is going to mediate that and throw them at me. I want to encourage you guys not to be shy. If you have any provocative questions, if you want to challenge any of my assertions, I am an old news guy and I am ready for you. So throw it at me, whatever you got. But again, I want to thank all of you for your patience with me. Thank you, Roland. That was fantastic. Uh, and let's go ahead and open things up for questions. Questions. It looks like Dave uh, has gone ahead and, and asked a few here. Um, and th this is more of a kind of a, a factual question. How long did it take to cross the country on the Transcontinental Railroad? And what did it cost for a ticket? Oh, that's a really good question. And I can tell you, uh, if you, for, this is my. Um, this is going to be my excuse, okay? It's in the book in detail because I can't remember the specific details, but I do remember this, that going from Promontory Summit where the two joined would have taken mm, like two days. And to go from, it really started, you know, in, in, uh, in the Midwest. So to go from the Midwest, because you'd have to do a whole bunch of jumps if you were going to go say to New York, if you were going to come over to, um, uh, to the Midwest, it's going to take you about five days if you're going day and night. And insofar as the costs are concerned, of course, it would be tears, right? So if you had a lot of money and you wanted to spend money on the sleeper, it would be very expensive at that time. But if you were going to go steerage, you know, on these hard wooden seats for five, six days, it would be relatively affordable. Very importantly, aside from the distance and the cost, which are really good questions and, and I think a very relevant point here is to, you, I want you to think about this. The frontier ended because of the railroad. I talk in some, I write in some great measure about the extraordinary travails that the pioneers had to surmount to cross not just the mountains, not just the Rockies and the Sierras, but that incredible stretch of the Great Basin, the deserts there, and how many, how many hundreds, maybe thousands died under the most horrible circumstances there. That was over. That was over. You could get on a train and it brought together the nation only that, but it ended the Western frontier as we know it. Interesting uh, answer. So uh, another question from Dave, and, and this kind of feeds into the kind of the tail end of the talk. Why do you think someone wanted to kill Jenny Stanford? You know, I, I love that question and I hate that question because it's a, one of the most important questions I always get asked. And I don't have a satisfactory answer for you. I don't know. I deal with the potential suspects always in, uh, in the book and I have to knock them out one after the other because as any homicide investigator will tell you, and I even, I even went so far as to go invest, talk to an interview some of the best homicide investigators that I've known during my reporting career. And I have spent more time worrying about that than I can possibly tell you. You need to have a motive and you need to have an opportunity. You have to have both. It can't just, nobody did this accidentally. So I can give you some people who had a motive, who were jealous of her. And you might ask, for example, what about people in the will? Nobody in there gained anything from the will. They'd already gotten everything and they'd already done really well for themselves. Opportunities would have been, for example, one or two, three people who were on her staff with her, but those people were already put into wonderfully um, prosperous situations themselves. They had been given houses. They were traveling luxuriously with them. So I really apologize. It's, I know it's going to be a, a really unsatisfactory cop-out, but I I have to be honest with you, as somebody who's just interested in facts and not in speculation, I've been a great believer in that old line about the, uh, 
about the uh, news and the history of verification, not assertion, unlike too much of our news information today that we hear and, and read about. I don't know. I won't pretend to know, and I wish I did. Hopefully, this mystery will one day be solved, but I don't have high hopes for it. Okay. Okay, so we're going to come back to Jenny in a second, but a, a question more about Stanford University. And when did it make that transition into being a great and famous university? And, that, and that's from Dave. That's, uh, again, something that depending on who you want to talk to, I think you're going to, the, the safest answer is going to say after World War II. Before that time, for example, in the first graduating class at Stanford University, there was a guy named uh, Hoover, uh, a guy who, who was born in Iowa, uh, was an orphan, came to California kind of late in his life, and of course, the Hoover Institution, and he was our president, of course, um, not Jay Hoover, <laughs> uh, uh, but when he graduated from Stanford in 1895, it was just a nothing place. And there was a lot of, a lot of um, hostility towards this place because Leland left all this money to this place in the middle of nowhere instead of giving it to the University of California where he had for a very short time been a regent. But apparently and reportedly, and I think there's probably a lot of reason to believe this is really true, he wanted to, really controlled the University of California with his money. And they said, no, it doesn't work that way. Just because you're on the board of regents, it's not going to work that way. So in a huff, he said, well, screw you. I'm not going to give any of my money to uh, the University of California. I'm going to start my own university. But it was just a podunk school. With the birth of, for example, the Varians, who profited enormously from the kind of technologies like vacuum tubes, um, and then later on, of course, the Hewlett's and the Packard's, and then much later on, the people like Robert Noyce and so on and so forth. Uh, it really began its ascendancy. After World War II, it becomes known as a, a place to be reckoned with. And in the 50s becomes much more prestigious. And of course, you know, in the 60s and the 70s, getting into Stanford becomes a very, very desirable uh, uh, place to go in some measure because it's private. And Americans kind of have this association if it costs a lot of money it must be much better right uh that's the best answer i can give you okay uh thank you uh here's a really good question from melissa uh is stanford university's prominence the main reason why stanford and even the other big four are remembered positively in california despite defrauding state country out of millions of ra railroad revenue why do you think history is forgotten about their robber baron status. You did that, you're right. That is a fantastic question. And thank you for asking it. Yes, the first question, the, the first part of your question is I think that um, I think that it has been left behind because of the prestige of the university. The university, of course, has an enormous endowment and it spends its money. Uh, uh, in some not insignificant measure on its own publicity, and it does so brilliantly. It has a publicity department that is extremely well endowed itself. Now, that is one way to deal with it, and they do a pretty good job with it. But I have another explanation for that, which I think uh, almost anybody, particularly we Californians and we Westerners uh, who are interested in history uh, and are interested in media will completely and immediately understand. As you well know, an awful lot of our history and our, our public information, if you will, whether through books or magazines, uh, network television, uh, is really controlled from people from back east. So if you go, for example, to the Morgan Library in, in uh, Manhattan, and you will go into their bookshop, you will see oh, six or seven different biographies of the Morgans, JP and his dad, Pierpoint. I don't know anybody in California who's really interested in the Morgans, but when I was trying to get East Coast publishers interested in Leland Stanford, who has this international, national, and I hate to remind the people back in New York, California is not only the biggest, wealthiest, but most powerful state in the United States. They're like, oh, California that you must have like some caissons and horses out there that you're, you're talking about. They, there's just no understanding of it. We're locked out of the New York media market. 
And it's a slight exaggeration, but we are definitely uh, a second cousin over there. And I think that has an awful lot to do with the lack of interest and the lack of real scholarship and a real lack of understanding about how important not just Leland is, but yes, the big four and other important Californians have been besides Richard Nixon, for example. Okay, so here's a question that um, sort of bumps off uh, the previous in your answer. There's long been a rumor that Harvard turned down Stanford, who wanted to build a memorial to his son there, or perhaps did not accept his son in the school because when Stanford and Jenny visited the school, they were dressed shabbily. Um, and the president of Harvard would not uh, see him. So Stanford decided to build his own university. Is this true? No. <laughs> Short no. In a word, no. And I'll quickly tell you, President Elliott, who was the president of Stan at Harvard at the time, I I've heard that this rumor has a lot of different permutations. I've heard it spun many different ways. And it's, it's legitimate to, to try to chase this down, which I did. Uh, Elliott entertained Jenny and Leland after their son died. They came there and they took a tour. They walked through Harvard Yard. And uh, we have first person accounts by a guy named Butler who became a president of uh, Columbia University later on and, and wrote extensively about this. But there's other collaborating evidence that sustains this and confirms this. He walked through there and Leland rather infamously kept asking Elliot like, well, how much would it cost to build all this? And President Elliot said, well, uh, Mr. Stanford, you, you, you can't just write a check and have a Harvard. We're, we've been here for hundreds of years, and it's taken us hundreds of years. The, the real capital here is not the grounds, it's not the buildings, it's not what's in the buildings. It's the intellectual capital here, but it's taken us hundreds of years to develop that. You can't just cut a check and go it. But uh, they insisted, the Stanfords insisted, they wanted to know how much did this cost, how much did that cost. And there's not an American on, in the world who doesn't understand that kind of attitude that people have. Uh, we're all kind of embarrassed by that kind of uh, mainstream American attitude, but that was very much the way the Stanfords looked at it. They weren't turned down. Uh, Elliot did not discourage them from doing their own. They always wanted to have a memorial to them. There was this implication at the beginning that maybe it would go to the UCs, but at the end of the day, he had this 8,000 plus acres and it was a perfect place to build his memorial to his son. Plus, he would have total control over it over there. Okay, okay, thank you, Roland. Um, question about, uh, let's see, Jenny's role. What was Jenny's role after she finally reunited with Leland? Throughout her marriage, there was a very traditional 19th century situation. You know, two steps behind him, buy me a lot of jewels, take me on vacation. Uh, he was the man. Uh, hard to hard to imagine that today, but you know historically that has been way too often a woman's place. Maybe a power behind the throne, but even she didn't know anything about the business. She wasn't interested in that. She was interested in travel and clothes and baubles and so on and so forth. When she got thrown into this situation, and she had really very little formal education herself maybe the equivalency of a high school uh, diploma. But when she got thrown into this with his death in 1893, she was completely unprepared for this. And this is what makes her story still more remarkable. As she went from zero to 60 in a matter of nanoseconds from a historical standpoint, she had to understand all the convoluted business that went behind this. She had to understand what was going on with the university. She had to understand what was going to go on in the courts. And she managed to ramp up in a matter of years. She had some very important help with this, but she had the intellect, she had the spirit, she had the energy to do this. And she saved that university and made it really, gave it the foundations that make it what it is today. It's a remarkable story. And I wish that somebody would really, it's not gonna be me, but I do wish that somebody would really take the time to really do the, the, uh, a real history about Jenny Stanford, because she is quite something. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's interesting. So um, here's, a, here's kind of a fun question. Um, your favorite physical marker or building in Sacramento that relates to the standards? You're sitting in it. 
<laughs> James, you're sitting in it. You're sitting in it because uh, yes. I forgot to mention this. So thank you for that question. When Leland came to Sacramento and he assumed control over the Stanford Brothers store and his next door neighbor were uh, Hopkins and Huntington around the corner were Charles Crocker, they were trying to kind of... Um, uh, maybe this is the wrong word, but I'm feeling a little bit feisty this afternoon, weasel their way into public life. But they were smart. They wanted to do it slowly. They were not, uh, they were not impetuous. So one of the first things that they did is they put together a subscription to start the Sacramento Libraries. Leland Stanford and his three compadres there, his three comrades, if you will, are the people who started the Sacramento Library. And that remains my favorite monument there and tribute to him and to your community. That's right. And it, and it was a subscription library transitioned to a free library in 1879 um, with the Takei building on I Street and then we moved over and into this building in 1918. So thank you, Roland, for mentioning oh, that. And our oh, it's connection to Well, I want to mention also, my mom is a librarian, so I bow to you. Ah, <laughs> thank you. It's a good life. It's a good life. Yeah. So uh, a few more questions, maybe? OK, cool. So um, OK, so here's a question um, from Galaxy Tab A. Um, hmm. Was Stephen Field one of the judges who decided the railroad case? Stephen Field was on the, well, Stephen Field started here in California because of Leland Stanford, and he was very much Stanford's client. He became one of Stanford's uh, closest friends, as a matter of fact, and uh, oftentimes uh, visited him and stayed with him in the, in the Nob Hill mansion. Stephen Field, of course, eventually became, as, as the person who's asking this question undoubtedly knows, uh, on the state, on the United States Supreme Court. And his influence there is hard to dispute. Because while Jenny was back east lobbying the president of the United States and pushing the attorney general of the United States, who was in charge of the prosecution, she was also very often with the Fields. One of her closest friends was Justice Fields' wife. And he kept giving her unofficial advice on how to manipulate this case over and over and over again. So remember, there are nine people for the time being, on the Supreme Court, <laughs> and, and I'll leave it at that, but uh, yes, he was terrifically influential by all accounts, and was very close to the Stanfords. Okay, and then um, another question about Stanford University. Uh, so, so we know that Stanford was, was named after uh, Leland Jr., um and done so by by Leland Senior and then also Jenny, but sounds like the college was already up and running before he died. Is there any truth? Yes. That there, okay, so there yeah. was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it just started. Uh, they they built this. The main building there was not the university. The main building there was the museum, which in the book you'll see photographs of. It's incredible. I think it was the largest private museum in the country at the time. It's just cool. huge. Uh, and when I first, the first time I saw an image of it, I was sort of taken aback. And uh, this is where they like to put all the stuff that they bought, which they bought a lot of stuff when they were in Europe and so on. And there's a special room in there where they put all of Leland Jr.'s stuff. And it was sort of like a Sancto Sanctorum, uh, the Holy of Holies, where only Jenny could go in there with maybe a couple of her closest friends and look at Jr.'s um, collection of stuff. Uh, but that was really the most important thing for her. And then the 1906 earthquake destroyed much of the museum and a good part of, uh, there was this magnificent arch. And if you go down Palm Drive, those of you are familiar with the university and you come to towards the quad, there was this magnificent arch and it was destroyed in the 1906 earthquake, but it was up and running, yes. Okay, okay. Um, and then a question from Dave, uh, very interesting question. Do subscription physical libraries still exist anywhere in the United States? Um, You'll have to ask James that, not me. Yeah, they, they do. I think they do, don't they? Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, and the, the one I'm most familiar with is in San Francisco, and that's the Mechanics Library. Where which... I spoke about my book uh, to a crowd of like 500 people. Wow. Just before, wow. Just before the pandemic. Okay. Okay, so 
I, I do have some friends, sorry. I do have some friends who actually do have subscriptions to the mechanics library and it's supposed to be absolutely out of this world. It's pretty cool. Um, and just, just physically a beautiful place to spend time in addition to that. And particularly if you like to play chess. They have, oh, yeah. a, have, they have a whole portion of there just for chess and it attracts chess masters from around the world. It's really a pretty cool place. It's downtown. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go in and take a look at it, uh, it's a little, people are a little bit stiff there, shall we say, uh, <laughs> but uh, that's all right. It's all right. It kind of adds to its formal ambiance. Yeah. 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 Um, and in, Dave, to add to your, uh, the answer to your question, uh, the, in Sacramento proper, we also have the mechanics exchange, oh. which is a trade library. Um, so you can find, um, you know, the, the current codes, you can find old copies of the codes, um, in addition to any number of, um, you know, manuals on X, Y, and Z relative to construction. So it's, uh, it's, it's a thing, it's a thing for sure. Sure. And it is subscription. Um, so Betsy jumps in here. It would have made more sense for Stanford to have his vineyards locally <laughs> at Mill Station, Brighton, and Elk Grove having vineyards why up north. And you're right. The, the uh, Joseph Routier had his, his Zinfandel vineyards over near what would become Mather Field. But Roland, do you have any uh, have a view on that? I, I don't really have a view because uh, I'm not much of uh, uh, an enophile, shall we say, you know, my favorite review for a wine was goes down easy. But <laughs> aside from that, I'm just a simple guy from the East Bay. What do I know? But I do know this, that Leland's first attempt at uh, becoming um, uh, a wine um, magnet, shall we say, well, 100 acres in what is now Warm Springs, the Fremont area. And he, in his great generosity, gave that to Josiah, who would, he, without Josiah's older brother would have been nothing, but he gave that to Josiah. And then I think one of the uh, big winery uh, corporations, I forget which one, not Almaden, but one of those bought it and they, finally they raised and put houses there. But uh, that was his first attempt. Why he went to Vina, I can't exactly tell you, except that the land was cheap. And I can also tell you it was probably a huge mistake because uh, it was just too hot for the kinds of wines that he was trying to, to put in there. And he hired hundreds, maybe thousands of people that reputedly were experts in, in starting a vineyard, the French and, and other people. And um, it just didn't work out. The, the, the quality of the wine just went down into the toilet. They had a lot of trouble with it. And it, it never made money. It lost a lot of money all the time. So after he died... Jenny, who had, a, a, I don't know, I guess sort of a, a nostalgic fondness for it, uh, started selling it off piece by piece. But the stories out of Vina, uh, some of them are really violent. Some of them are a little bit scary. Some of them are really strange. Are stories that I have in the book. And if anybody's interested in the history of winemaking in California, I strongly suggest that you at least get to those parts of American Disruptor. Okay, cool, cool. All right. So it looks like that might be it for questions, everyone. Um, I, I did post again a little message on our next talk on May 22nd. Um, any other questions, folks? We've got the we've got the man here. All right. So it looks like that might be it. I'll tell you, Roland. Oh, get it. And, the, and there <laughs> is that beautiful cover. Uh, 2000. Oh, and we've got a. A round of applause coming your way. Uh, published 2019 by University of California Press. Very impressive um, to get a book published um, with them. Really, really impressive stuff. Um, and I'll tell you, Roland, not many people can do a presentation without a PowerPoint. <laughs> um, you, you are magical um, being able to do so. So um, a dynamite talk. Thank, Thank you, you so, much. so much. You're very kind. I, I have been asked to do PowerPoint presentations, but and, I and, hate them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's, we have, it's we have lots of pictures in the book. I'll very quickly just let you know we have all kinds of illustrations in there. 
you guys can have your own PowerPoint stuff. <laughs> and it does, it did just come out in paperback if you want to spend a few shekels less. So I encourage you uh, to think of that. But of course, uh, I'm a huge believer in the libraries and that's where I get most of my books. So why don't you try that as well? Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Very gracious, Roland, and a lot of really fantastic uh, comments and link to the recording. Um, it's going to be YouTube. It's going to be on YouTube. And then what you're going to do is you are going to search for the Sacramento Public Library channel. Excellent. Um, and it's there under featured videos that you're going to find today's talk. So just kind of follow that pathway and you'll be able to get there. So uh, Roland, thanks again. Viewers and visitors, you guys are awesome. Thanks for spending a little bit of time with us on this Saturday. And let's all look out for Roland's next book because it is happening. <laughs> Thank you, Roland. Thank you.